Welcome everybody to UFO Man Live. My name is Tim or UFO Man and to my side is my friend and my co-host Tommy Highway. Tommy, tell us a little bit about our channel and introduce yourself. Hello folks, my name is Tommy Highway and I'm the co-host of the UFO Man channel. Um, we've actually been reporting on UFOs, UFO incidents, ufology, alien abduction for a couple of years now. But I wanted to go ahead and give you a little bit of, uh, let's just say, a little bit of summary of, of who we are and what we do. Our mission at the UFO Man Network is to bring about disclosure through investigations and collaborations with other ufologists and, of course, you, the people that are witnessing these unexplained phenomena. Our channel is dedicated to reviewing data and sightings from all over the world of explained, unexp sorry, unexplained phenomena, including video and eyewitness accounts. Each week we post videos that are submitted to us by the public or provided to us by other reliable sources. These videos are put through a process to either authenticate or debunk each sighting whenever possible. We at the UFO Man Network believe that the truth really is out there and that each of us possess a small piece of a very large puzzle. The more of these small pieces that we can connect gets us much closer to our ultimate goal of full and complete disclosure. We need your help. We've provided you with the means to submit a reported sighting to us on our reported sighting page. We also have provided a toll-free number as other means of reporting a sighting and experience directly to us. Your personal information is always kept strictly confidential. And folks, we provide this because we believe in it. We believe that, uh, frankly, that, that we have not been receiving all of the information that the government has on this subject. Um, there's just too many sightings. There's just too many videos, too many eyewitness accounts to believe that these things are in fact, you know, some sort of a trick of light or something of that nature. Uh, we don't believe that to be the case, folks. Jim? Or even foreign adversarial technology in some cases. Um, some of the uh, objects being seen are definitely ruled out by the Pentagon and Department mm -hmm. of Defense recently as uh, they do not know what they are. So if they don't know what they are, we're left with several other options, but we'll go into that later. Um, we'd like to introduce to you tonight our very special guest, Ralph Blumenthal. Tommy, take it away. Folks, I just want to go ahead and give you a little bit of information about our, our very special guest. We're very honored and privileged to have him. Uh, let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about him. Ralph Blumenthal was a reporter for the New York Times from 1964 to 2009. Uh, and he has written seven books based on investigative crime reporting and cultural history. His latest book, The Believer, Alien Encounters, Hard Science, and the Passion of John Mack, was published by High Road Books of the University of New Mexico Press on March 15th of 2021. It's the first biography of Pulitzer Prize winning Harvard psychiatrist John E. Mack, who risked an esteemed career to investigate stupefying accounts of human abductions by aliens. So, folks, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our featured speaker this evening, and that would be Ralph Blumenthal. Ralph? Hey, guys. Thank you. Real pleasure to be with you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Our pleasure. Can you okay. tell us a little bit about yourself, sir? Yes. Well, um, as, as Tommy said, I spent my whole career at the New York Times in very earthbound <laughs> reporting, uh, crime, uh, the mafia, uh, Nazi war criminals, uh, really nothing to do with uh, um, UFOs and aliens uh, for the major part of my career. Um, I did get into the John Mack story in 2004 uh, when I was reporting from Texas and picked up one of his books. Um, and that was really the first encou encounter <laughs> that I had, uh, how I was captured by uh, the subject as John Mack was captured. Um, I mean, I had, you know, been interested in science fiction growing up as my generation was uh, because uh, we were captivated by stories of going to the moon and Mars and all that. But then uh, I kind of forgot about it until I ran across John Mack. So that's that's how I got into it. And then I, I through things we can talk about, uh, found out about this Pentagon a unit that was investigating UFOs. And we broke that story in 2017. Right. I, I read, um, I, th I think it may have been the New York Times that you were the co-author of that article with two other people, uh, Leslie Keene and Helene Cooper. That's right. 
And um, what led you to the information to writing that article, Ralph? Uh, okay, well, I knew Leslie because she is uh, a distinguished author of a UFO, a book on UFOs, many articles. Uh, she's an investigative reporter who's dominated this field for 20 years. So um, I knew about her because I had been um, looking into the field because of my research for the John Mack book since 2004. Right. And uh, Leslie came to me one day and said that she had attended a meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, with Lou Elizondo, who was the head of this secret Pentagon unit. Nobody knew about it uh, until then. Uh, that was investigating UFOs. You know, the, the Pentagon was supposedly out of the UFO business with, with Project Blue Book in 1969, only, of course, it never really was. They were still interested, very interested in UFOs, but they didn't announce it. They right. pretended that, you know, there was nothing to see here, folks. Just just move on. <laughs> um, so Leslie attended a meeting where Lou announced to, to this small group that he was resigning as head of this unit, which no one even knew existed. And um, because he wasn't getting enough support. Right. So Leslie came to me with that story, and I thought it was a sensational story. We, I took it to the New York Times through my contacts at the Times, and they quickly picked up on it. And, uh, you know, we, um, we got that story into the Times. We started working with Helene Cooper, who was a Pentagon correspondent, because she had great sources in the Pentagon. And uh, the three of us got that story on the front page of the New York Times on December 16th. Uh, 2017, first on the web and then on the front page, and it was it was a sensation. It, oh, I'm sure. Uh, in fact, I would have to go as far as to say that you, sir, may have very well have been part of the process to release one of the not only the greatest story of our time, but consider the greatest story of our species. Uh, yes, um, I think personally, uh, it was the pivotal point. Mm -hmm. the turning point for ufology to come mainstream. Absolutely. It brought it out of the barn. It, 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 uh, it brought, let's see, how can I put this? It put a face on it. It actually it brought some credibility to the subject of ufology. I mean, it, like Tim and I joke all the time on the channel, it, it's, it made it so it's no longer the tale told by a drunken hillbilly. Right? <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's, it's well, real. Oh, real people are having this. It's, it's nice to hear. I, you know, I, I can't take all this credit because uh, it was a question partly of being in the right place at the right time. I mean, a lot of things had been going on before that. The groundwork had been laid. Um, but uh, I, I do think that it's fair to say that uh, that story on the front page on a Sunday of the New York Times um, did, uh, you know, shout out loud and clear that this subject was now safe. For, for the mainstream media to tackle. And uh, it came at the right time, you know. Uh, right. uh, as I said, the groundwork had been laid, uh, uh, but this was the, the kind of a tipping point, I suppose. And after that, I mean, we brought out two videos at the time. We later added a third video, a Navy video, uh, which proved quite sensational because the Times put it up on its website showing uh, radar tracks and images, thermal imaging um, of these uh, objects, these UFOs or UAPs, as the Pentagon started to call them, unidentified aerial phenomena. They don't right. like the word UFOs. It sounds too, too you know, too woohoo. But um, you call it whatever you want. They're unknown objects, unidentified, but they exist, and right. that was really proof that they existed physically. You know, for a long time they were written off as you know, swamp gas or uh, hallucinations or spiritual constructs. And now there was proof from, from the Navy that these things had physicality, whatever they were. So right. uh, I guess that, that was a tipping point. Right. Well, thank you for your efforts and your research in that matter. Um, it really changed my viewpoint of ufology, even though I already knew in advance that UFOs were real because I've had a couple close up sightings within 50 feet, 500 feet in the air. So I have actually had close up sightings. And so has uh, Tommy. Mm -hmm. uh, Tommy, uh, take away with the uh, first question. Well, I guess there's so many, uh, Ralph, there's so many questions I, I really want to ask you. But I mean, I guess at this point, where did I even start? Um, 
let's say, let's talk about the the videos that we've seen, the, the, what we know has actually been declassified and is out there in public domain at this point. Um, being as how, you know, you were certainly one of the people that were instrumental in bringing this thing to the light. Do you have a theory on what these things could be? You know, I try to stay away from speculation because uh, I think that weakens the story. I, I like to take it one step at a time. And I want to say that um, my reporting on John Mack from my book, uh, and his interest in alien encounters uh, should not be confused with our reporting in the New York Times, which does not go into uh, the intelligence, if any, probably is, but we don't speculate in the New York Times on what these objects are, where do they come from, who's behind the wheel, why are they here, right. um, because uh, that's way ahead of the data. Uh, right. We try to stick with the data in the New York Times because that's that's our credibility. We want to go with what we can document. And what we can document is that these things, as I said, they exist. They've been caught on radar. They've been caught on, uh, you know, gun cameras, thermal imaging devices. Um, so we know and, and, and pilots, the most highly trained observers we have in this country, um, entrusted, with, you know, with our defense, uh, with all kinds of secrets. Um, they have they have eyeballed these things. So there's a witness account. Uh, in addition, they're not just you know ordinary people who say they've seen these things. These are our most highly trained observers. So anyway, so I like to say let's stick uh, you know for the moment with what we know and what we can prove. That's pretty sensational as it is because years ago we couldn't even say that. Did they exist? Didn't they exist? You know, is it mythology? Um, so now we can say yeah, they exist. So now the question is well. What about all the other things? You know, where do they come from? Who are they? Why, et cetera? Uh, right. I think little by little that information will uh, will come, but it has to be scientific. It has to be backed up. It can't be speculation. And right. uh, you know, we we got to keep our credibility. So um, uh, you know, I, 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 it's important to to make that statement. Also, you know, we should talk about how this is going to come out in contact in the desert, right? Right. Uh, uh, you want to deal with that now, or you want to talk? Sure. About, you know, sure. What What are you, uh, What was the catalyst uh, that led you to present what you're going to do this year in contact in the desert? Great. Well, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity, by the way, to bring so many uh, you know talented people together uh, to discuss this phenomenon. I mean, which is uh, extraordinary, and you know, it, it certainly can, has the prospect of changing changing history, you know, one of the most important stories ever, uh, you know, uh, tackled in, in human history. Um, so I'm going to be doing two things at Contact in the Desert, June 25th to 28th. Um, I will be giving a talk on, um, uh, which I call impossible yet true, uh, how alien encounters captured John Mack um, and uh, captured not physically, because he was never captured, he was never uh, abducted, uh, nor was I, uh, but the subject captivated him. So this will be a story, you know, I'll, I'll tell about uh, how this, you know, esteemed Harvard professor uh, suddenly got caught up in this very controversial area um, and, 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 and lent his credibility to this subject, which really went a long way. So that's one thing. I'll talk about John Mack and his great contribution to this field. Um, and then I'll be giving a workshop called In the Footsteps of John Mack, where I will talk about how the book came about and how I, you know, with my uh, very earthbound background at the New York Times, got involved in the subject and um, how I found out about John Mack and how I got access to his archives, et cetera, and what it what it took to write a book like this. Um, and I guess the, uh, you know, one of the mysteries uh, involved that I'd, I'd like to talk about is how books choose their subjects very often, certainly true in my case, uh, more often than subjects choose, more often than authors choose their books. Um, in other words, an author doesn't sit around, at least in my case, you don't sit around saying, hmm, what am I going to write about next? It's kind of serendipitous. Um, things uh, happen. It's a synchronicity sort of, you know, comes into play and pushes you towards something. Is that a 
download from the universe. You know, I, I don't know. We can talk about that. But I got pushed in a certain way to write this book, and that's one of the things I like to talk about. So okay. it's, it's more of an organic type of a process, and, and I can absolutely relate to that myself. Um, and, and you're right. You don't sit around and say, okay, I'm going to write about this tomorrow. Uh, it doesn't quite work that way. And, and it's uh, a driver will tell you that the driver doesn't find the car. The car finds the driver. And I think it's exactly what we're talking about here in terms of, um, of being an author. I uh, couldn't agree with you more, sir. Okay. Um, what I want you to do, if possible, Ralph, is elaborate a little more on your book, uh, The Believer. Okay, well, um, so John Mack um, was a, a Harvard psychiatrist, a very brilliant guy, charismatic, tall, blue eyes, magnetic to men and women. Uh, he had immediately attracted a lot of supporters because he was brilliant. Uh, he was a wonderful talker and knew his field of psychiatry, you know, intimately. Um, um, he was brought up in a rather conventional German Jewish household that was not superstitious, not religious, not um, uh, spiritual in any particular way. Um, and, uh, but through a series of circumstances that I outline in the book, he became more and more convinced that there was more to the world, the cosmos, to existence than the reality we immediately see around us. Um, and um, it started when he, um, he went out to um, uh, Esalen uh, in California and got involved in something called holotropic breathing where he could alter his, uh, co his consciousness by rhythmic breathing. And uh, he, he, so he suddenly realized there was more to the, to, to, to the world than what he could, you know, immediately see the reality that we recognize. He found himself taken back to his uh, pre-birth, actually. He felt he, in the womb, um, and, he, and his mother had died of um, appendicitis when he was eight and a half months old, so he lost his mother. So he felt very close to that, that process. It was a wound in his life that I think it helps explain why he was searching for something missing in the cosmos, some other life in the, in the cosmos. Um, so anyway, so that kind of opened him up in the beginning. And then uh, he got an introduction to Bud Hopkins, uh, who was an artist, uh, who uh, really was a pioneer in the alien abduction field. He had uh, interviewed and hypnotized, taught himself hypnosis, hypnotized a lot of people with uh, abduction stories. And he shared them with John Mack. And Mack had, and originally thought that the uh, Hopkins had to be crazy. These people had to be crazy, which is everyone's first thought. This is not possible. Everyone agrees it's not possible. And yet it happens according to what they recount. So that's how John Mack got into it. And that's the process I follow you know, in the book, uh, how he got into it and why he got into it. Um, uh, along the way, he got interested in, in uh, Lawrence of Arabia. He saw the movie like we all did. Thought it was a great movie, a little long. <laughs> but um, so he went to England and um, researched uh, Lawrence's family, he went to the Middle East. He became an expert in the Middle East. He tried to make peace uh, in the Middle East between the Arabs and the Palestinians. We know how that went. <laughs> uh, met with Yasser Arafat, but he tried. He got involved in the um, uh, movement to ban nuclear weapons. We know how that went but he tried. Uh, so he was very engaged in a lot of things. And then, as I said, uh, I traced the process by which he, he turned his interest to uh, uh, these alien encounters, which just stupefied him that how anybody could, how this could happen, how people could have really, you know, well remembered, um, you know, accounts of meetings uh, with alien beings is, uh, it, it's, it remains a mystery, but it's fascinating. Right. Tommy? Fantastic. Well, that's fantastic. Um, I, I'll tell you, when it comes to alien abduction, there have been so many stories out there. So many people have, have actually had these encounters and have been you know, under hypnosis and, and things of that nature. Um, do you have any idea about how many people he actually put through the process? Yeah, I know how many people. He, he hundreds. I mean, he first of all, he didn't hypnotize everybody. Uh, he 
he regarded hypnosis uh, with, with caution because um, it is controversial. Um, they are, uh, they are, uh, a hypnotist who is not well trained can um, uh, influence the, the, the seeming memories of the person being hypnotized. So it has to be done really very carefully. And John Mack realized that. Um, he preferred to use just relaxation techniques just to get people not into a deep trance, but just to relax enough so that their subconscious mind can recall details that might have been wiped out in some, in some way. Um, but also he talked to people uh, for their conscious memories and they often remember things consciously. Uh, that was very interesting. So he was able to debunk uh, the, you know, the skeptics who said, well, you know, the hypnotist implants these suggestions or even more, uh, you know, important, uh, the skeptics say, well, these are nightmares. You know, the, John Mack didn't understand. These people were just having a, a nightmare or sleep, you know, paralysis. Well, first of all, John Mack wrote a book on nightmares. He was an expert on nightmares. He knew what a nightmare was. Uh, and these weren't nightmares because they often didn't happen at night. <laughs> they often right. happened in the daytime, people driving a car or people walking around. Um, so, you know, there goes that theory. Uh, often it happened at night. People were in their bedrooms, but not, not always. So um, anyway, um, um, he, he, he brought some, some real rigor to, to his accounts. Now, he interviewed hundreds of people. I um, spoke to quite a number of them myself uh, in the course of this book, people he had interviewed and people I found on my own. And the one thing that comes through, I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but um, uh, these people seem eminently normal in every other way, except for this, this experience. They come from all walks of life, uh, professional blue collar people, men, women, children as young as two or three, uh, who say, you know, little man, take me up into the sky. I fly in the sky. Uh, you can't say these kids are, you know, describing a book they've read. They can't read. <laughs> they, they haven't, they're not describing movies. They've, they've never been to a movie. So anyway, uh, there's one of the things, that's just one of the things that convinced John Mack he was onto something. Right. Um, the, the book that I got to refer to that, Drew, drew me to John Mack was this one, uh, Abduction, Human Encounters with Aliens. Um, it really influenced whether I would come out publicly about some situations that occurred to me. Um, I don't know for certain if I was abducted, but I do know for certain that I woke up with trace evidence. And um, I had bruises on my legs. I had bruises on my arms. I had uh, what looked like a vaccination in the middle of my sternum. And I had three, uh, two to three suture marks behind my left ear uh, when I had never had ear surgery. Hmm. So I had all of that checked out except for the bruises of course they went away on their own um but the vaccination mark is still there after 11 years i got it in 2009 and i still have it it's like a welt it's round and it has six puncture wounds in a circle so it looks like a vaccination now when i checked that out with my doctor he said that's what it was and i told him i'd never been vaccinated there he said, well, it would be really odd to be vaccinated on your sternum because that's cartilage. Right. But that's exactly where it was. And then the spot behind my ear was uh, an indication of a possible implant because the doctor at one time said that he felt something underneath there, like a nodule. Uh, but we left it alone and um, he didn't remove it. I know I probably should have, but he did not. And what happened was, is um, just a couple of years ago, uh, I felt an itch back there and I didn't feel the nodule anymore. So it could have been removed. So I, I do believe that I'm one of those people you're speaking about that has had some kind of experience, 
but I don't have any waking memories of being on a ship or being taken up by little gray beings or large gray beings or reptilians or mantis beings or whatever you subscribe to. But um, it has happened. So I do agree with you, uh, Ralph. Uh, it is a definite phenomenon and it is something that we need to bring out to the public. There, there's more than just trace evidence involved here. There's more than just uh, people having these uh, these visions, if you will, or dreams or whatever you want to call it. There's more than that. We've actually interviewed folks here on the channel who have actually had and been confirmed to have had metallic objects and different, um, let's call them implants, different places in their body. And that seems to be sort of a recurring theme. In fact, we even know someone personally who had one su suspiciously removed. Um, so I, I think that deny putting this into the denial category simply because of the hypnotic aspect of it or anything like that. Well, okay, we can do that. But what about all of the other evidence? What right. about uh, Betty and Barney Hill's uh, vehicle, the car they were driving and having those round spots on the trunk that were polished? I mean, there's just so many different occasions where the person is reporting this type of uh, experience but they also have some sort of trace evidence. Ralph, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, that those are all very good points. That it's not just one thing that uh, you know points to the to this phenomenon. Um, first of all, uh, the uh, the scars or scoop marks that people have noticed after what they remembered as an abduction are very interesting because uh, in one case, John Mack uh, investigated uh, the person who who found these marks was a quadriplegic who could not move. He was paralyzed from the neck down. He could not have inflicted these on himself. So that's interesting. And um, um, again, uh, it, it's only one of a number of indicators that, that uh, convinced John Mack that there was something uh, really physical to this process. It wasn't necessarily entirely physical or in, in the reality we recognize. But there were, as you said, um, th these um, uh, bits of evidence, fragmentary evidence that put together made some kind of a case. Now, one thing that Tim said was very interesting. He, he didn't remember being abducted or being on a ship. Um, and very often, uh, people uh, did not have what we call or what has been called the core abduction narrative. So what, you know, what is popularly referred to in the literature and, you know, in the movies, et cetera, as the usual, the quote, usual abduction experience where people are accosted in their bedrooms and beamed through, you know, solid walls or windows to a ship and uh, for, you know, medical experiments or reproductive, you know, producing hybrid children. You know, that's one account uh, that, that some people have given but it, it's not always the case. And what, what intrigued John Mack was that while there is a consistency, there was a basic consistency to these stories. A lot of people told similar stories. There were also many small differences. And some people didn't remember being abducted at all, but they had these marks or, you know, uh, they were um, seen by, by witnesses to be missing when they remembered that they had been abducted. So there are a whole number of other bits of evidence, uh, the presence of UFOs outside the window when they remember, just before they remembered being abducted, or um, um, uh, small children who told these stories, as well as, as grown ups and children, you know, uh, can't be accused of borrowing from literature. Uh, right. uh, in one case, two girls were having a sleepover. And uh, the, the mother of one of the girls came down during the night to check on them and found them missing and called the police, very alarmed. And the police searched all over, couldn't find the girls. A few hours later, they were back in their beds. And later they said they remembered being you know, abducted. So here was a, a witness account of a mother who said they were gone when they remembered. So all these little things put together, the, the, the scars, the presence of a UFO, the witness accounts, the little children, um, all these things uh, added up to something um, w which really made it uh, more intriguing to John Mack and, um, and, and harder really to debunk in some kind of blanket way.
I was going to say, Ralph, I remember John Mack talking to the Dalai Lama uh, in regards to UFO and alien life, and that the Dalai Lama just basically said, yeah, they exist. They're here. They've been here for a long time. Um, and he is revered among many people. Uh, so when I saw that, I was just completely mind blown because it's like, wow, the Dalai Lama himself is verifying alien life, yet the U.S. government can't. Right. Well, uh, I have this chapter, you know, section in my book uh, when John Mack was invited with a number of other um, uh, psychiatrists and scientists to meet with the Dalai Lama. Um, and that was in 1992, and that was never acknowledged after, you know, afterwards, afterwards by the Dalai Lama. He had enough trouble with China uh, that he didn't want to get involved in, you know, alien abduction. But he did, he was very interested, and he invited these people, and John Mack met with him. And I had the transcripts, because John Mack kept the transcripts, which w was supposed to be secret, but he, he kept them, and they were in his archives, and I got a hold of them in my research. And it was very interesting, as you said. The Dalai Lama is a spiritual leader of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, it's, you know, it's no revelation to him that there's an unseen world, a spiritual world that is, you know, beyond the boundaries of our recognizable physical reality. Uh, he knew that. Uh, Buddhists understand that, that there's um, a subtle realm. And uh, he was interested in what John Mack's take was because Mack was a Westerner. Um, who came from a scientific materialist culture. So the Dalai Lama was interested in how, you know, Mac, uh, you know, wrapped his arms around this. And they, they basically agreed that there was, uh, you know, uh, something uh, mysterious and subtle and spiritual about this whole phenomenon. And the Dalai Lama was very interested in what Mac had to say with his stories from his experiencers. And Mac was interested in the Dalai Lama's take because um, Tibetan Buddhism has a you know, a history, a heritage, a tradition of, of small beings. Um, so um, it is a story I tell in my book, and I found it very charming that these two uh, you know, iconic figures from different ends of the world would get together and discuss this thing. Yes, it was very impressive when John Mack visited with the Dalai Lama. Tommy? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. That, that's that's got to be a tough ticket to get a hold of. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, you know, that that's impressive. And the thing about it is this has been something that's been going on for a very long time. And, and this could have been going on for, you know, thousands of years for all we know. Um, we do know that we have cave paintings, we have uh, ancient carvings and things like that, depicting things that look an awful lot like we know of what an alien looks like today. Um, and we're talking about Tibet. There was, uh, there's a story uh, somewhere in the mountains of Tibet where a UFO, they were actually doing some sort of a, I think China was doing some sort of strip mining uh, operation, something like that. And as they're digging into the ground, into this mountain, they actually discovered um, a, a flying saucer, a craft of some sort that was in incredibly poor condition. And when they did a carbon date on this thing, um, it could have been more than 65 million years old. Now, story goes, and again, this is unverified, but it's been around for a while. The story goes that they actually gain entry into this craft and they're finding cages in their small cages with tiny baby dinosaur bones. So that's how long this thing could have been there. So it's not like the phenomena is a new thing. It's not like alien abduction, UFOs, or any of that stuff is, is something that, um, that we're just now learning about or coming to terms with. Our ancestors were doing that. Right. I mean, the folklore is very interesting. Uh, you know, the Bible talked about Ezekiel's chariot and fire. Uh, accounts from the Middle Ages talked about, you know, strange uh, visions in the skies, fiery crosses and uh, phantom, you know, uh, galleons uh, in the colonial era. Um, it seems that every era sort of uh, projected or saw things in the sky that seemed to match the technology that they had at the time or that they didn't recognize what a flying saucer was because nobody knew anything about airplanes. So right. they interpreted it in their own way. That's another, uh, you know, hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, but clearly uh, folklore and there's some, you know, wonderful uh, scholarship on the subject um, is replete with stories that in retrospect seem to be flying saucer stories. Now, again, 
Um, can can you prove it? Are, are there videos from you know ten thousand years ago? You know, no. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, there the the so-called scientific evidence is lacking, uh, is, is, uh, particularly with regard to implants. I mean, I am not aware of any body of, of scientific uh, evidence that has corroborated implants. Now, a lot of people have felt them, you know, like uh, Tim and uh, people have sneezed stuff out and, you know, it's been analyzed, but the phenomenon is very strange. Um, it seems to defy uh, conventional proof. Uh, and whenever something is, somebody gets his hands, his or her hands on something that looks like an implant or some, some piece of evidence, it has a strange way of evaporating in one way or another, going missing, or it, it's not the object that they thought it was. In one case that John Mack investigated, um, uh, uh, something that was a uh, guy found implanted in his body turned out to be a biological nature. I mean, MIT tested it. It was biological. So are the aliens so clever that they will disguise an implant as by or turn it into something biological at the last minute? Who knows? But th that is part of the mystery of this phenomenon. Although I have to say this, there <clears throat> is um, a surgeon by the name. Well, he's uh, the late Dr. Roger Lear. Um, yeah, he, did, he did about 17 surgeries, and out of those 17 surgeries, he removed 17 items. Um, at least 12 of them were tested, and they were said to be a, uh, a meteorite-like uh, material. So if the meteorite material was implanted in these people's bodies, how did it get there? Because usually people don't step on them or walk and have them implant behind their ear. So what I'm saying to you is, I think there is some credible science out there in regards to some implants, but you are correct in regards to most of them incredulously evaporating, and then we don't have the evidence, and then it becomes speculation again. But in regards to John, uh, Roger Lear, he did have some solid implants. The problem with that is, is some of the implants were not alien in origin. Some of them were actually RFID chips that were put into people's bodies without their knowledge. So how they got there, I don't know, because those are man-made. Right. So um, yeah, Roger Lear does have a body of, of work um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Well, I've read about it. I have read about it. Okay, and he does have some scientific evidence to prove that some of the items that he's removed is of a nature that should not be there. Uh, not necessarily alien in nature, but from space. Well, you know, you, you, if it, this brings up an, an, an area we may not want to even go into, but you know, military uh, abduction, my lab, and the possible government role in disinformation here, that is a whole other area. Um, right. And uh, the government's role in this whole uh, UFO, uh, you know, history um, is uh, really checkered, to say the least. Very disturbing, right. actually, uh, going into MK Ultra and things like that, where the government was experimenting on unsuspecting, you know, Americans. Uh, right. And it sounds like something out of a horror novel, but it was all confirmed by the Senate in its investigation. Sure. So um, uh, there's a lot of strange stuff out there that um, has remains unexplained, you know, what the government's role has been. It, it goes beyond just debunking uh, UFOs, which they did regularly, uh, you know, ever since the 40s. Right. Um, so, uh, you know, to what extent were they, uh, you know, planning disinformation or um, that is, it's a huge area and it's one that's very difficult to penetrate because a lot of the, the records that have, have been made available don't include that. Um, right. A lot of records are missing. So um, anyway, um, 
you know, in, in my reporting, I try to stick to what can be confirmed. And there's no end of speculation you can do about stuff that's missing and that you don't have. So right. I prefer right. to, you know, in my certainly in my reporting, to stick to stuff that you can, you know, uh, document with with you know official government records or interviews right. on the record, etc. Well, what was it, the late 80s, I believe, uh, very late 80s, maybe even 1990, where the big story came out about the fact that I believe it was during the 50s, if I'm, not, I'm not mistaken, the United States government had been experimenting by actually injecting raw plutonium into American citizens. Um, I don't know if that was part of, of uh, MK Ultra, but they were certainly using LSD and psychedelic drugs, and people were going crazy, and... Um, uh, it, it was a terrible chapter, and I don't think, uh, and those records were destroyed, as I remember. Yeah. Uh, the, the Senate committee couldn't get their hands on it. So, um, uh, actually, the woman who uh, first got John Mack interested in, in alien abduction, who introduced him to Bud Hopkins, um, called herself a victim of MK Ultra. And when I first read that, I thought, you know, she was some kind of a kook. Um, but the more I looked into it, the more I realized that uh, MK Ultra certainly existed. Whether she was a victim of MK Ultra could not be determined because the records were destroyed. So all you have is her anecdotal evidence saying, I was taken to Cornell. She mentioned Cornell Medical Center, and I was injected with this, and they did this. And, uh, you know, without any documentation, it's impossible to corroborate. Uh, the problem we're having lately is even with documentation, that can be fraudulently uh, right. mislead Absolutely. people. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard right now to tell what is uh, being said uh, publicly about the UFO report that's coming out on June 25th or around that date, because we don't know whether it's a disinformation ploy by the U.S. government to kind of give us a little bit and then suppress everything that's uh, that we really need to see, you know, keep it in a classified annex. Well, I want to separate two things. One is uh, you're absolutely right when you say it's almost impossible to verify certain documents. We at the New York Times have looked at some documents that um, we were assured uh, by some very reliable sources were 100 percent accurate. And they certainly looked like authentic documents from the period, um, right. all the right markings or so. But um, then we were told by other reliable sources that some of those documents were produced in, in various forms uh, with introducing small uh, errors uh, or um, inaccuracies in the documents to mislead adversaries, perhaps, among other reasons. So while the document might be genuinely from that period, it might include misinformation or disinformation to throw people off the track. So it's a really a hole of mirrors when you get a hold of a document from that period that seems to, you know, point to some UFO crash or UFO landing, etc. And you say, well, it's right here in the document. And then you find out, well, the document may not be 100% authentic. It may be 75% authentic and 25% fabricated. Mm -hmm. But um, right. I will stick up for the UAP report that is um, coming coming out. We believe by you know by the end of uh, June, um, we have very good sources in the government, and uh, I'm I'm convinced, uh, really uh, quite quite confident that the report is not disinformation or you know I mean we haven't seen it yet, but it is it may not be complete. It may not be as illuminating as people want. There may be, there very likely will be a um, classified annex that will not be shared with the public. Right. Um, uh, only with, uh, you know, Senate Intelligence and <clears throat> Services Committee staff or members. So, um, but I, uh, I, I would not go so far as to say that, you know, report that's coming is going to, you know, is likely to be disinformation or fraudulent in some way. I, I think, uh, uh, there's no reason to believe that. Right. Well, that's good to know. Tommy? See, I sort of have a problem with um, having any part of this this particular report classified. And, and let me tell you why. Um, if we're certain that this is not secret American military technology, and we're at 99.999% certain that this is not a foreign adversary's technology, then why 
at that point, would we be censoring or omitting um, or classifying any of that data unless we're just simply doing it to keep the information away from the public? And I just wondered what your thought would be on that, Ralph. Well, listen, I'm all for sharing everything possible with the public, but I can understand. I'll give you a hypothetical. What if, what if the government uh, had been able to analyze um, these, these uh, you know, UAP or UFOs to the point of duplicating the technology to some extent and said that we have reverse engineered this ability to, uh, you know, to cloak, to, to turn invisible, to operate underwater. Uh, we have mastered this technology and we're working on that. I mean, I'm not, certainly not saying that's the case, but if they were to say that we know how they do it and we are uh, we have done it or are doing it ourselves, that would be very uh, helpful to an adversary. So you could say, well, you know, okay, that is possible defense information. You know, I don't think that, uh, I mean, it, it strikes me that there may be something, I don't know, that it could be classified in this area that somebody could make a case for. Now, the question of classification doesn't lend itself to debate. The government doesn't say, this is why we're classifying this bit of information. They just classify it, period. Right. We don't get access to it, and we and we don't. We, we can't. I mean, we we haven't dealt with classified material. We, we don't, you know, uh, risk jail to do it. Uh, everything we have reported on has been unclassified, uh, on the record. The videos that we put out were never classified. You know, they were... Uh, um, you know, we declassified by Lou Alessandro before they we, we got them. So anyway, um, so uh, but I you know I wouldn't say there's there could be nothing that could be classified. I, I don't know. Uh, that remains to be seen. But I like you. I want as much to be in in the public domain as possible because the American people paid for this research, and we the American people or the people of the world. Um, are the ones who are going to be most affected by by it if if these things are uh, off Earth, um, extraterrestrial in some way, uh, or some other you know uh, technology that we don't even understand? I mean, uh, who better to share it with than the people of, uh, of the planet? Um, right. You know, uh, you know, we've been ahead of this thing before, uh, be ahead of the government anyway. Uh, in the years when the government was saying there's nothing to see here, folks, you know, there's no such thing. It's all explainable. Every UFO is, you know, is uh, has earthly origin. It's a reflection of lights. It's this, it's that. Um, and people, ordinary people know that that was a lie because they looked up and they saw these things and they saw the, you know, the, the, um, the cockpit uh, windows and the revolving lights and they knew they weren't looking at the planet Venus. And they weren't looking at some marsh gas. I mean, that was a you know fantasy from the government. So, you know, you could say that the the public was ahead of the government from the beginning on this. Yes. Um, uh, for instance, I got to get for instance here in regards to uh, knowing whether uh, ex experiencers of actual UFO events are telling the truth. Um, I would have to say yes on the grounds that I've seen something, like I said earlier, 50 feet away and 500 feet in the air. Um, and it was in broad daylight with uh, 11 other people. So uh, we watched it for over 25 minutes. And it wasn't one item. It was six craft in a horizontal line, rectangular in shape, and within the rectangles, it looked like morphing fire. So if you ever seen the movie Independence Day, where yeah. the ship breaks into the atmosphere and it's on fire, that's exactly what I saw within these rectangles, but it was confined to the actual shape of the vehicle. And they were each evenly spaced. And I've told this story before on this channel, so everybody in the chat probably knows about this. Um, no sound, stayed evenly spaced from each other. There were six of them, okay? They moved as a group, Ralph, and then they stopped. And then they moved back, stopped, flew off towards Spring Valley, which was probably 40 miles away in a, in a split second. They came back and stopped where they were originally. 
and we watched him for 25 minutes just sit there, and the second one from the left was tumbling end over end. We tried to film this on camera. I saw it through my digital screen on the back of my digital camera, and I thought I was filming it. And when I got it afterwards, all I had was distortion. There was no image, so they did not appear. So in regard to UFOs and the credibility of people that see things, we on the UFO Man channel have to take them at their word at first because that's all we have. We have the provenance from them telling us where it happened, what date. We can check the weather. We can check with the sheriff. We can check with the... Uh, uh, we have data. We have we the have, data. We can get data to back it up. But that's the hard data in regards to UFOs. Now, when it comes to alien beings coming into a person's house, that's more subjective. We, we really can't get hard data except for trace evidence. It's, like, it's, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's just not happening as often as a, as a regular sighting does. It's just not something that, even if it is, it's something that's so interpersonal for a person to have to go through that most people probably don't want to talk about it. Um, one of the things that, that I've always found, found was um, so tragic about this subject uh, is the stigma around it. You know, yeah, the fact yes. that you, you can't, you know, you've had these experiences and I myself have had a couple of experience and I was a government employee for many years and I had to keep an absolute lid on that. There was no way in, in the world I was going to tell this story to my colleagues and be ridiculed and that where my bosses gets to, gets to them. Next thing you know, my clearances are over with, right. um, you know, so it, it, I think that's the tragedy. We haven't been able to be able to openly discuss something that is clearly happening in our environment. And, uh, you know, I, I'm hoping that it, this report and, and everything that we're doing right now in this interview and this channel and this movement uh, will lift some of that stigma so people can actually be unafraid to come forward. I think it, it will help certainly with the UFO sightings. Uh, there was a time when people who reported UFOs, including, mil you know, military personnel, were stigmatized. They jeopardized their military, you know, their uh, classification, their... Um, uh, you know, access to security information, to clearances. Uh, they they could, they were referred to psychiatrists, um, commercial pilots who often see these things, uh, UFOs. No doubt about that. Uh, we're also told they knew, you know, from their airlines not to report them. So I think we've gone beyond that now. The Navy has officially said we want you to report uh, sightings. We you know we're compiling a database. So that that's a lot of progress. Um, it's it's still a huge leap to uh, alien encounters because um, right. they, they are much um, more difficult to document, as you say. Um, they have not been caught on on video and and film as as UFOs have to to a varying degree of, of you know precision, um, but they're much more complicated. Uh, they're much more, uh, as you say, you know, interpersonal. Um, and people who have uh, hooked up cameras in their bedrooms, you know, to, cat to, to capture images of, you know, alien beings coming at night, invariably find that frustrated. As you say, the film is fogged or it doesn't record. Um, so uh, that's a whole other, which is why we stay away from it in, in the Times reporting. We, we, it's just, we, we're not at the point where we have the same documentation that we do have with UFOs. So until we have that, uh, we have to treat it as basically anecdotal. It's what some you know, people have reported, a lot of people, but it's not anything we can shed a lot of light on at this point. Right. Although it does um, draw a direct line to John Max. Well, he, you know, um, he realized how difficult this area was, uh, uh, but he tackled it anyway, and it got him into trouble at Harvard. Uh, they can, as I lay out in my book in, in some detail, they convened a secret committee. I call it an inquisition because it's a word that they used explaining to him what it wasn't. <laughs> they said, this is not an inquisition. And he's a psychiatrist, so he's thinking, well, why would they use a word to, to, to what it wasn't? To say right. what you know. Um, anyway, they 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 inquired secretly into his uh, his methods, his finances, his beliefs. You know whether he thought UFOs were real, all kinds of things. So it wasn't kind of an inquisition. Um, 
And in the end, they found no grounds to discipline him. They thought he was a little too enthusiastic um, in his methods, which he was. He was he was he was a little naive. I mean, that he thought he could jump into this area and not incur the wrath of an institution like Harvard. Uh, and right. of course, he couldn't. Uh, they were angry, and uh, uh, but in the end, uh, they you know just told him to. Uh, you try to be a little more circumspect in your statements, etc. Uh, but they found no, you know, misconduct, uh, nothing wrong, no fabrication, no, uh, you know, misapplication of standards, etc. And he went on to continue, and he went on to branch out into other anomalous uh, fields like crop circles and, uh, uh, you know, uh, near-death experiences, survival of consciousness, etc. So. Um, but he was very courageous to tackle uh, this area that was, uh, uh, you know, stigmatized. Uh, right. Took a yard, took a yard of guts, absolutely, and especially um, any time before the last year or so, anybody that would come forward. I mean, they they had to have all the courage in the world to do that because of the ridicule, the stigma, you know, all the negative aspects of ufology and 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 these. Uh, these experiences, you know, they're going to have to, they would have to experience. And that's unfortunate. I mean, how many stories were not, were never told because of the stigma? Well, here? That's right. Uh, how many people decided not to come forward? And, you know, just to get some of these people to talk to him, uh, again, what the, the so-called skeptics say is, oh, these people are looking for publicity. You know, they can't wait to sell their story. On the contrary, John Mack had to convince them uh, to talk to him. They, they often started with another psychiatrist. Uh, who would invariably uh, tell them that they were uh, deluded or mentally ill or they were, you know, fabricating it. And these people were really beaten down. And then they finally found their way to John Mack, who uh, at least listened to them. Um, and um, but they uh, they were not eager to tell their story. On the contrary, they try to think of every reason why they shouldn't tell it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That that's absolutely right. You know, you, you get to the point where you want to you want to be able to release this from your from your mind, your soul, if you will, or whatever, uh, and you want to be able to do that. But there's no there was re really no great forum to do it in. And even if you went to a support group, well, quite frankly, I, I've talked to some people from support groups and all of that, and some of those people um, probably aren't very genuine that that are in there. But then again, oh, wow. so it's really hard to sort all of that out. And I mean, I just. Like for me, again, it, it was torture. I wanted to tell my story, but I was afraid to, literally afraid to for numerous different reasons. Well, that's also, not right. You know, the other thing is these stories are so strange. And, you know, so they, they generally, they fit a pattern, but there's so many variations in that pattern that I've heard some of these stories and they just blow my mind. I mean, one story is stranger than the next. And to think that somebody would be, um, you know, willing to come forward and share that story that takes a tremendous amount of courage, and mostly they, they want to do it anonymously, you know, without use of their names. So um, uh, it's a terrific burden for people, and and many many really many uh, have had experiences like this, and their and their children have them, and that's what really scares them that they this thing seems to run in families generational. Um, for some reason, it looks like. Uh, um, you know, grandparents, you know, the, their children, the parents, then the children. Um, so uh, for some reason, it seems to run in that kind of a, a pattern. Um, but people are terrified. I was going to say that uh, I have met a lot of people along the way. And some of the people that I talk to, and mo most likely most people that I talk to, I ask them, have you had encounters? Because that's that that's my interest, and they they will come right out and tell me it's like there's no uh, restrictive uh, pause. They will automatically tell me, but then when I ask them, "Will you come on camera?" They're like, "Oh, nope, can't do that." I, I had exactly the same experience. I, I went to Roswell a couple of months ago to get boots on the ground, interview a lot of people. I probably talked to 150 people. And nobody was really, although everybody was that was from there, they believed this happened. I had all kinds of theories about it, things of that nature. But people are very uncomfortable to go on camera because as soon as they go on camera, they're afraid that their credibility as a person will be damaged. 
And I mean, and, right. and they're right in thinking that just because of the way our society led by the way our government um, has always handled these types of encounters, these types of stories. Right. You know, I start my book with a little anecdote about a, um, um, an English scientist in the 1870s, Sir William Crookes, uh, who was sent to uh, visit a seance and report on what was going on there and debunk it. His fellow scientist says, you go look and, you know, make a report. So he goes there and he watches musical instruments being played in a locked cabinet with nobody touching them. He sees, you know, people levitating and he comes back and he tells his fellow scientists, you know, I saw it. He says, I never said it was possible. I only said it was true. So uh, that's what we're left with. These things are not right. possible in our understanding of reality. Um, right. And yet, uh, you, you know, the, the, the stories that people told John Mack, and he was a psychiatrist, he knew when they were lying to him, uh, when they were fabricating um, their affect, their emotional, um, uh, you know, signatures, when they, when they recounted these things, were all genuine to him. So um, uh, he said it, it, it doesn't seem possible, and yet uh, there's no other explanation. That on the, other than something happened to these people in some dimension, maybe not our dimension, maybe not our reality, but uh, somehow it, it was real. Something penetrated our reality that we don't understand. And we have to uh, begin to come up with some theory that explains other realities. I mean, that's as close as he came right. explaining it. I just think it's so sad that, that people, um, especially in Roswell, would – would come up to me and, and just, I mean, just dump this on me, their entire story, anything they've ever experienced. And, and like, I'm like, I'm a priest, like I'm father highway. But as soon as that camera comes out saying, Hey, would you mind, you know, going on camera so others can you know listen to your experience that the conversation is over. We're done. You know, and it's just, that's sad. Again, yeah, it's and all, that's all the stories right that now. weren't told. Yeah. All the stories that weren't told that have been wasted that, that we could be using to put together this big, as more pieces uh, for this big puzzle, they're not going to tell us about. Well, because you know what, of let me say this, that John, John Mack in his book that you put up on the screen, Abduction, uh, is, it tells the story, uh, stories of 13 people, 13 case studies. And uh, he gave them um, pseudonyms, okay, because he wanted to protect their identities. Well, some of them um, came out under their own names afterwards. And people that... Um, um, you know, other people who, who, who are cited in books, uh, Bud Hopkins books, he gave people pseudonyms and some of them came out under their own name afterwards. So that's interesting that eventually uh, people came out from under their pseudonym and said, okay, this is, some of them wanted to write their own story because they figured they'd already, be, you know, been written up by somebody else telling their story under a pseudonym. So, okay, I'll stand behind my own story and here I am. So a few of these people have come forward, which also took a lot of courage. One of them was on uh, Oprah with John Mack, um, and he was subject to a lot of ridicule on that show. Um, but he he came out that you know under his own name. So there are a number of people who are create create courageous that way. I remember uh, Bud Hopkin Hopkins interviewing uh, the. The pseudonym name was Linda Cortile, but her real name was Linda Napolitano. And she finally came out under her real name, but she was the Brooklyn Bridge abductions. And that was seen by that um, head of state from France, I think. No, no, that was um, uh, Secretary General of the UN, Javier Perez de Cuellar. Oh, that's right, from the oh, UN. Yeah, yes, book. exactly. Um, Unfortunately, this is interesting. This is really interesting. Yes, Linda uh, Cotile, real name Napolitano, uh, did tell a story to Bud Hopkins. It was a sensational book. The Brooklyn witnessed this, the Brooklyn Bridge abductions because people, uh, witnesses, did see her flying out of a window into a spacecraft. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, as I, I spend some time in my book talking about this case, the two people who were the original witnesses who, who came forward to, to tell Bud Hopkins they had seen this unbelievable sight of a woman levitating out of her window with three alien beings into a spacecraft that then plunged into the East River, into the water. Right. These two people who communicated with Bud 
and sent him audio tapes and letters and emails, could never be identified. Bud tried to find them because uh, when you're trying to uh, you know, establish a story and someone sends you information, it's not enough to take that information and say, okay, I have the information now, it's written down, it's documented. You gotta right. talk to the person who wrote the letter or sent the email to make sure that this is a real person and he saw or she saw what you know they said they saw. Right. And, and Bud could never do that. It really is one of the most confounding cases in ufology. And um, it is, and it's interesting because it's not just uh, accidental that he couldn't establish the um, identity of these two key witnesses. This is the nature of the game. This happens again and again that it, it, it's elusive. And this is what frustrated John Mack so much. Just when you think you got it nailed down, it slides away. And that is not, um, you know, again, a, a, a flaw or an accident uh, in, in the genre. This is the nature of the beast. It it's by cannot, design. Yeah, it cannot be pinned down uh, easily or at all under our conventional, you know, methods of knowing. So that's what drove him, you know, up the wall. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, um, I've noticed that a lot of people don't want to step out of their out of their box, so to speak. They, they have a certain viewpoint of life. I mean, you get up in the morning, you have your coffee, breakfast, go to work, work all day, come home, have supper, be with the kids, wife, go to bed. That's, that's your day. That's your day every day of the week, day after day after day. And then you don't see outside the box, meaning you don't have the ability to wrap your mind around anything more than what you're handling at the moment, mm -hmm. which I understand because there's only so much a human being can handle at one time. Right. But then again, if you step outside the box, you'll start seeing and researching things that will just totally mind mm -hmm. blow. It will blow your mind so much that you don't, it's hard to grasp because it's not our viewpoint on life. It's kind of like how for the longest time, Ralph, um, everybody on the planet thought that we are the center of the universe. I was going to say, uh, well, you know, physics is helping us now expand our, uh, our boundaries because uh, the, the findings of quantum physics uh, are challenging some of the simple notions of reality that we have. Um, I mean, how can two things affect each other separated by a great distance? Uh, how can an experiment, um, be, be, you know, be dependent on your conducting the experiment? A thing will happen one way if you don't, um, uh, you know, experiment with it. And then if you do experiment with it, it happens another way. Um, how can people affect a series of random numbers, um, which, um, uh, you know, experiments have, have verified. Uh, how can there be remote viewing? How can people see things thousands of miles away? Um, you know, these are all mental powers that uh, are very difficult to, um, to document, and yet uh, there are instances uh, of it. I mean, precognition, dreams that predict the future, all these things that um, challenge our understanding of the way things work. But ba basically, again, going back to physics, um, physicists are finding these properties in nature that challenge uh, a, a very fundamental, most fundamental understanding of the way things work. So, um, you know, we are not at the end of, of our knowledge. We are at the, at the very beginning. And uh, anyone who says, well, that's not possible, this can't be, you know, uh, you know the, the sun has to be moving around the earth because it comes up here and it goes down there. So it's got to be, the sun's got to be moving. You know? um, yeah. So we have been through a lot of this. And John Mack made a whole point of saying this, all the different revolutions in science that changed our, our thinking, starting with you know, Copernicus and Darwin and then Freud, you know, we thought that man was the master of his, of his own psyche and Freud said, oh no, there's all these dark forces that you're not the master of your soul at all. You're the victim of all these dark urges that you don't even understand. Um, so, and now comes John Mack to say, uh, well, I mean, he wasn't the only one, <laughs> they, but uh, people were coming forward to say that they were encountering these other entities 
that made no sense. It just you know didn't commute compute, and yet uh, they they were so convincing in their accounts that uh, John John Max said that there's got to be something there. Right. Absolutely. It's the first step. You have to take that first step into the unknown. And then once you take that step, and it's a it's a big step to be able to come out and and talk about this experience and, and actually let people know that you've had these experiences. It's such a big, huge step that a lot of people don't take it. But once you take that step, it's life altering. Um, yeah. At that point, you feel like you can just go ahead and uh, and be honest about your experiences and you can be open and things like that. And thank goodness, thank goodness, guys, that, uh, you know, we're finally in a time where the stigma, again, is being relieved. And, um, you know, it's it's time to to get down, figure out what's going on here and stop with the, you know, with the talk about crazy people or you're hallucinating or whatever. Let's find out what this person actually knows. Right. But this, but the stigma still exists a little bit because cool. there are some people that I know that can't get security clearances for government jobs anymore mm -hmm. because they may or may mm -hmm. not be a co-host on my channel. That's right. I've been, uh, I was recently told that the days of my getting uh, super high government clearances are over because I'm involved in ufology. So. So because of his personal sacrifice to bring the truth to all of the people in the chat room and everybody participating online, plus any other people who come along and see our website and so on and so forth and uh, visit Ralph Blumenthal's site as well, um, you're taking a risk like we are. Yeah. Well, I try to minimize that by staying within what I know and differentiating my my John Mack, you know, research from my New York Times reporting, um, and I try not to get ahead of the material. I mean, as I say, there's a lot of speculative, uh, you know, uh, uh, stuff out there. Uh, I, I I try to uh, stay very clear on what I can confirm. The stuff I've written for the Times with, with my colleagues Leslie Kane and Helene Cooper has been documented. It's been on the record. There's no anonymous sources. Uh, we don't go beyond um, you know, what we know. We did a, uh, a lot of people thought we did something quite unusual and striking with our last story that that brought up the subject of um, crash retrieval. Uh, right. And we got some flack for that because some people out there thought uh, we were holding back. Or we, did, we only reported a small portion of what we what they thought we knew. Um, and why didn't we say more? And you know, it caused it, it caused us a lot of anguish uh, because we were trying to tell a, a story in the New York Times that was documented and solid. And what we ended up saying was that uh, um, congressional staff had been briefed um, about. Um, I got to choose my words carefully have been shown slides and been briefed um, about uh, possible recoveries of crashed uh, of UFOs, okay? okay. Uh, so uh, some briefings were held and um, we didn't go beyond that. We, we, whether the materials, who's in possession of the material, what the materials are, we didn't go there because we didn't have that data. All we knew, and said was that there were slides shown to uh, congressional staff that referred to you know off-planet ve possible off-planet vehicles and material, possible material retrieved from from crashed objects, uh, right. and, and that was a fact. The congressional people were briefed. There's no question about that. Sure. Oh, sure. How much of that was true? In terms, of, in other words, how much information was conveyed? We don't know. It's classified. Um, right. And we didn't go beyond that. But uh, you ask, you know, um, what kind of a risk we're taking? I don't think we're taking a great risk. We're, we're just telling a story that we can uh, that we can document. Uh, we tell it the best way we know from from sources on the record, reliable people who have firsthand knowledge. Um, it's not speculative. We don't say what we think these things are or where we think they come from. Um, and I think that's important. And that, I think, has, has maintained our credibility. And that's why the time stories are held up as, as you know, sort of a paradigm changer. Just, yeah, the I, just the facts, no frills. 
Yeah, I wasn't saying that you were taking a risk. I'm saying that general people, civilians, uh, in general, feel as if they're taking a risk if they come public. Um, I know that your paper is based on fact only. And so you present what is fact to the public. And that's what we get when we read the New York Times. And we appreciate that as a public because that's what we're looking for is truth in reporting. We're not looking for uh, gloss and floss, all that glittery stuff. We want to hear the truth. And that's the point. Feed, just like we do on the channel, feed us the facts, feed, tell us what you know, and we'll make up our own minds. And that's how it's supposed to be. You know, we're right. not looking for anybody to to influence our own thoughts. We want we just want to get the raw data out there. That way we can all put it together and say, OK, you know, what do we believe? and What do we not believe? But I do have a, a real quick question, Ralph, uh, since you you have been uh, uh, you know, researching and writing about uh, John Mack and, uh, you know, all the, the different things that you've you've written about. Have you ever been followed? Have you ever had any kind of experience where you didn't feel uh, safe because you were talking about the subject? No, not at all. And, and neither did John Mack, by the way. Um, and people asked him, you know, you were dealing with, uh, you know, stuff that the government was very reluctant to confront. Uh, they asked him, were you ever harassed or uh, investigated by the government? And um, the answer was no. Um, he, he, he said he was not, which I found very interesting because you might think that someone would try to interfere with him. And he said no. And same with me. I've never felt that, um, uh, you know, anyone was, uh, you know, trying to interfere or to harass me or, you know, subvert me or whatever. So, um, I mean, I think that's that's encouraging that we live in that kind of a country, too, uh, where uh, reporters are left alone to do their work. Um, and, you know, my st as I said, my stuff has not been speculative. It's not, we haven't, you know, tried to s sneak around to get, you know, classified material because we know what the law says. And um, there's enough unclassified stuff to be interesting, including the videotapes. Uh, right. Uh, Lou, uh, I think it was uh, Lou Elizondo. No, it, yeah, it was Lou Elizondo who said recently that there's a lot more video going to be coming out. And not just him, but Jeremy Corbell as well stated that. Uh, and it should be out by the 25th or a little bit after. So we're expecting that. But the thing is that we've talked about on our channel is we know that jets, uh, our aircraft, have 4K cameras. Mm -hmm. So if they have 4K cameras on board, besides the FLIR, the forward-facing FLIR cameras, how come we're not getting uh, the 4K images? We're getting the, the FLIR only. You know, we don't know. We you, You're absolutely right. And Lou has said that um, there's much more out there. The government has collected much more information than they have released. We, we, we understand that. That the videos that we released were only portions of longer videos. So right. not only more videos, but even the ones we uh, excerpted um, are just a portion of what they have. So there's no doubt they have clearer pictures. Uh, you know, I don't know what they what their what their pictures are, what they have that they haven't released. Um, right. I don't know what will be released. Uh, you know, when they release the uh, UAP report, the task force report, how much will be classified, how much will be public, whether there'll be any images released in conjunction with that. Um, but clearly, they have more than they've put out. Um, and I guess one of the things Congress can ask is um, whether the American people should be entitled to more uh, of this information. But you can't make that argument until you know what they're going to put out. So right. We'll, exactly. have to see, we'll have to see what they what they include in this report. Well, I do know that there has been a feeling going around that the U.S. government doesn't want to put out a lot of information. And the reason being is because of the way the U.S. public reacted like it back in uh, 1939, I think it was, when War of the Worlds was broadcast and the East Coast all freaked out. Yeah, well, that was fiction. Um, yeah, that was fiction. Um, you know, the government has long, they said they were long worried about how people would react. As I said before, I think 
uh, people have gotten pretty sophisticated. In some cases, there are many cases, they're ahead of the government. They know what they've seen. The government has said they didn't see it. <laughs> the people said we did see it um, mm -hmm. and we can live with it. Uh, I think the polls show people believe there is intelligent life elsewhere um, in the cosmos. Um, most people think that that's the likelihood today just because of the huge numbers of planets that seem to be Earth-like um, and just the chances that there would be some other kind of life in the universe doesn't seem so far-fetched. Um, so, you know, um, I don't think uh, one has to assume there'd be widespread panic. Maybe if they landed like the day the Earth stood still and started incinerating people, but there is no evidence. Yeah. That, that, that these uh, objects are uh, hostile uh, in terms of, you know, attacking, you know, humans. Um, so uh, basically they, they just seem to be up there appearing and disappearing and no one knows what they are. Right, exactly. And that's what we're left with. We're left with the mystery. And that's why we continue to research on the channel and reach out to people globally to get information and video footage and photographs and put it out there on the channel so that we can get other people to come forward and let us know what they saw and and build a database so that's what we're doing we're trying to push forward a grassroots movement to do a disclosure on our own people don't have to be as afraid anymore I mean, that's that's the bottom line. I mean, this is something that's being talked about in mainstream media. It's being talked about in, in every circle, at, le at least in this country. Uh, it's a subject that everybody's very, very interested in. And because we've actually had the government come out and admit that these things are, in fact, whatever they are, they are real objects. I mean, we have not only visual uh, confirmation of that, but we've got all kinds of radar tracks and different sensors and things like that. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, with the release of this report, no matter what we get, it will spur uh, the general public to be able to come forward and, you know, give us your story. We want to hear it, whether we can actually investigate something that happened in 1978 or something, maybe not. But we'd still like to hear your story because your story does matter. And I tell you, speaking for myself, and I know I can speak for Tim as well, when you're able to do that, when you're able to actually say, OK, this is what I saw, it is such a burden lifted off you. It's amazing. Yeah, and to quote Ralph, I have to quote you, Ralph, in regards to, um, oh, I just lost my thought. Yeah, anyways, in regards to, um, oh, take it away, Tommy. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you, um, it, it's just, it's, it's great that we've got journalists of your integrity out there researching this, uh, you know, doing the stories on this, because I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> Ralph, that is exactly what this movement needs. I mean, no more sneaking around. Let's just be honest and open about what we know and not speculate about anything else. And that's half the battle right there. Right. No, I think you're right. I think we have to be straightforward. We have to talk about what we know, what we don't know. And I think uh, Lou Elizondo in particular has been very careful about this. He, he does not speculate. They ask him all the time, where do these things come from, Lou? What do you really think? You know, and he says, we don't know. All we know is that we're documenting you know, their presence, uh, their appearances and disappearances, the fact that they seem to operate underwater because they've been seen coming out of the water, going into the water, which is pretty astounding when you think of it. It's not just up in space. Um, and we'll just take it one step at a time. And this is exactly what John Mack did. He, 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 um, he proceeded very methodically. He knew the stories were anecdotal, uh, that there were, there were limited opportunities to, uh, to verify them. But he, what, what, what could be verified, he did. And uh, he put it out there. And, you know, I, if I can just conclude with what I say at the end of my book, I try not to put my thumb on the scale uh, for most of the book. I let the stories speak for themselves. I let Max, you know, uh, uh, articles and, and talks speak for themselves. And people say, well, we've been waiting to hear, you know, what you think of all this. And we're reading the book and we don't know what you think of this. And I, I deliberately left myself out until the end because I wanted people to experience the story and John Mack himself. And then at the end I say, well, I think he broke boundaries. Uh, I think he was courageous to risk his career in this disreputable business of ufology um, and you know, alien encounters. And um, I, I liken him to Joseph Campbell's hero 
in this hero's journey. You know, he 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 he, he, he gets a mission. He he tries to evade the mission. He doesn't necessarily want to go out there. He goes, he gathers a lot of stuff, uh, has adventures, life, you know, uh, risking adventures, hair raising adventures, uh, triumphs. And comes back with a gift for mankind, which is the knowledge he has uh, accumulated, which he's put in his books and his his works. And um, uh, so he, I, I do say he's a hero at the end. And and I give a little pat on the back to humanity itself because we're the ones investigating the aliens, you know, uh, whatever the alien beings are, that they they may be coming here to investigate us. And to perform all these experiments that people say, you know, creating hybrid, uh, creating a hybrid race or whatever the r reality is of that. But here we are doing this research, trying to figure out who they are. So that's pretty great. You know, they may be millions or billions of years ahead of us in some ways, if, if they exist at all. Um, but here we are, poultry humanity, um, investigating them. So I think that's pretty great. Yeah, Absolutely. that's a big breakthrough for uh, humanity in general. Yes. Yeah. And um, before we close, we want to thank you, uh, Ralph, for appearing on our show tonight and uh, giving us your gracious amount of time. That's a pleasure. I really love talking about it. You guys are great interviewers. And uh, uh, if I can shed some light on, on John Mack and his career and uh, I'm, I'm proud to do it, and I was happy to, you know, have written the book that I think uh, credits him with uh, his courage and shedding light on a difficult subject. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Yes, and your book, uh, as I understand, hit, uh, hit number one on the Amazon bestseller list. Well, <laughs> from your mouth to God's ears, but it, it is widely available. It's on Amazon independent. I'd like to encourage people to buy it in independent bookstores because they need a lot of help these days, you know, with the pandemic. Um, um, it's available on Kindle, so you can have it instantaneously, you know, on your device. And it'll be an audio book next month. I was happy to hear just recently. So uh, people who want to listen to it in their cars or who have trouble, you know, reading, uh, with small print and this and that, uh, they they love audio books, so uh, it'll be available next month. That'll be really Fantastic. cool, and um, I I'm looking forward to picking up possibly even an autographed copy from you, Ralph. So what I'm going to do is probably pick one up, send one your way, and have you autograph it. Okay. You got it. You got okay. It. Thank you very but much. Even, you know, a contact in the desert next. I mean, in two weeks, uh, June 25th to 28th, uh, online, virtual. Um, I'll be talking. A lot of people will be talking. I'll give a workshop. Uh, a lot of uh, really eminent people are going to be there, uh, people who have been in this field for a long time, um, who have wonderful you know, information and insights. So uh, I encourage people to uh, sign up for tickets. And it's all virtual, easy. You don't have to travel anywhere. But right. the, you know, the truth is out there, literally, at Contact in the Desert. And believe it or not, uh, Tommy and I are actually being featured on Contact in the Desert. This is the uh, placard I have right now, but we will be updating it. But it is June 25th through the 28th, 2021. So it is starting in 13 days, I think. Yep. And the 25th is the date set for the UFO report to drop. So besides starting the conference, we're also going to go live that night. If the UFO report drops, Tommy and I are going live that night on the channel wow. to cover cover the UFO report. So That's we'll right. also be doing that. All right, we're but, looking at great times. Yep, it's it, it's the greatest story right now to be on top of. Yeah, and we're we're all a part of it. The humanity is a part of it. Everybody in the chat room. You're a part of it. Everybody participating online, you're a part of it. Whether you believe or not, you are a part of it. Yeah. So thank you for coming this evening. Tommy, any last thoughts? Just want to thank everybody for coming out. Ralph, thank you very much for being our guest, sir. Wonderful interview. It was my great, uh, both of our great pleasure uh, for you to be here. I'm sure our audience really enjoyed it. Uh, folks, just to give you a heads up, I did send a link out there. Tim and I are going to be doing 
uh, show tomorrow night for, um, for I'm sorry for for par the paranormal um, show. And I went ahead and I put the uh, the link out there for you. So go ahead and hit us up over there uh, tomorrow night. We really appreciate that. Again, I think this is something that. I mean, it's coming to a head. This whole situation is coming to a head. Now, sooner or later, we're all going to figure out what the truth is here because it's going to get to a point where it can no longer be hidden. And Tim and I have talked about this countless times on the channel. We've all, we're have all we all rocking a great camera in our pocket, which is exactly the reason that Tim and I have so much content on the channel. And it right. seems like there's more of an uptick on, in these sightings. People are getting, again, more comfortable to come forward and I think that's fantastic. But again, uh, Ralph, I just want to thank you for coming out, sir. You, you really made our night. Likewise. Yes. Okay. Yes, you have. So thank you very much. And from Tommy my, uh, and myself and Ralph, as we always say at the end of the night,